What is up, my friends? Today, we are gonna have a conversation about one of my favorite ways to catch them, and that's bait finesse fishing. So today, Jeff and I thought, let's make a mistakes video. We see a lot of the same mistakes over and over and over again happen with bait finesse fishing, especially with guys that are just getting into it. So even though this isn't necessarily a new technique or a new way to fish, it is certainly a technique that is really skyrocketing in popularity. You're seeing tons of rods and reels and baits designed for this coming out to market. And it can get really confusing as you start going down the rabbit hole. So today we're gonna analyze five mistakes that we see a lot of anglers make so that hopefully you don't make the same mistake or if you are making the mistake, you can correct it and catch more fish. So if you'd like to have a fun bait finesse conversation with us, let's do it. Welcome to the Hook of Tackle. What a oh, stud. Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> Cheers, my friends. Happy Sunday. All right, guys, some breaking news. What's this week at the Hook of What a beautiful post long fish. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that cut on that. That's a nice fish. It's cool. <laughs> Welcome back, my friends. I am Ben with the Hookup Tackle, the Tackle Otaku on Instagram, being joined by the number one bait finesse fisherman in the world, Jeffrey the King. That's me. Was that a proper title? 100%. I know it used to be swim bait right. stuff. But then swim bait stuff got boring. Yeah. And it wasn't fun. Yeah. And then I switched to BFS after fishing for four days in northern Japan, getting my ass beat for a tiny little trout. Yeah. So, and wasn't that rewarding? No. There's nothing like a tiny trout to just. Way better Make than it like all worth a while. double digit large mouth. Yep. Agreed. So Agreed. We're here now. Yeah. So we are talking about one of my favorite techniques, a super fun way to catch fish. But even beyond the fun part, it's a style of fishing that can really open up a lot of avenues and other possibilities in your tool chest once you kind of add it to your arsenal. And that is bait finesse fishing. Now, Bait finesse fishing, if we were talking about this topic 20 years ago, it would probably be a lot different conversation than what we're gonna have today, right? Now, bait finesse fishing is not new. It's been around for decades, right? It was really designed as a way to throw smaller hard baits that traditionally you would be throwing on a spinning rod on casting gear, okay? And through the course of today, we'll talk about some pros and cons of using one or over the other. This isn't really that conversation, but the idea with bait finesse fishing is there are times when using it on a casting gear instead of a spinning rod can really put a lot of advantages in your court. And then there's a lot of it that's just kind of a, it's a style thing, right? So, you know, it's just, it's fun to be able to pick up a light little casting rod and be able to manipulate and do cool casts that you can't necessarily do with spinning gear. So some of it's fashion, some of it's function, but for whatever reason you guys are getting into bait finesse fishing, it should, it should be about fun, right? And if you can't figure out the gear and you're making the same mistakes all the time, the fun tends to go away. So today we wanna to talk about some mistakes that we see happening a lot and try to eliminate those so that your fun level, no matter why you're getting into this, no matter what species you guys are fishing for, uh, can be maximized. Sound right, Jeff? Oh yeah. Okay, so let's start. So you and me kind of brainstormed really quick some five mistakes that we thought were important. I should preface, you know, everybody knows Jeff as the swim bait guy, okay? I, when I talk about bait finesse fishing, I know this seems bizarre and it mm. probably sound really weird to you, uh -huh. right? But remember, you're, you're a fisherman yeah, at first, the end of the day. right? I am a lure nerd first. Yep. 
fisherman second, mm. right? So I spend most of my days helping customers get the right stuff, finding the right things. I'm, I'm the gearhead first, fisherman second. You're the opposite, right? right? You're fisherman first, gear guy second, mm -hmm. right? When I'm helping people assemble bait finesse fishing gear or talking through bait finesse, I, I find that the conversations are closest parallel to swim bait fishing for me. Mm. And I know that seems weird because, mm -hmm. you know, today we're talking about lures that weigh like three grams. Right. And swim bait, <laughs> you know, might be, you know, three ounces or yeah. eight ounces or 12 ounces or whatever, right? But the same kind of misconceptions exist in both places when somebody is new to the genre, mm. right? So I'm going to start with my number one mistake okay. that I see guys make, and that's choosing the wrong rod. Ooh, that's a good okay? one. Now, I would say this is potentially one of the biggest mistakes in the swim bait world as well. Yep. A lot of times a guy walks in here and they want to get into swim bait fishing and they say, hey, I need, I need a, a swim bait rod, I want to get into it. It's like, okay, well, what kind of swim baits are you throwing? Well, everything. Everything, <laughs> yeah. Well, shit, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it, you know, nowadays a swim bait could be a skinny dipper. Yeah. It could be a K-Tech paddle tail. It could be a soft bait like a Citizen. Mm -hmm. It could be a, you know, an ice slide, a slide swimmer, a Hinkle trout. Like, yep. you know, a swim bait can be half an ounce to 40 ounces, yep. right? So one rod to do everything just is impossible. It's the same with bait finesse, right? So a lot of times guys will come in and be like, okay, I want to get into bait finesse. All right, well, what type of techniques or baits do you want to throw? Well, everything. Right? They want to throw a crankbait, they want to throw a jerkbait, they want to throw a soft plastic, they want to throw all these things. Bait finesse fishing is going to break down the same way that any other style of fishing is going to. There are rods that are built for hard baits, there are rods that are built for you know treble hooks and bending deep, there are rods that are built for soft plastics that are a little bit faster. In today's world, there's even bait finesse rods that are built for non, like true bait finesse techniques. Does that make sense? So let's analyze this a little bit further and talk this through. So let's start right here. This is our number one selling bait finesse rod in the shops. This is a good place to start. So this is a rod built for, by Megabass called the Triza Aello. Now this is a multi-piece rod. It's a 6.3 F0. Basically it's kind of the perfect blend if you were going to choose a kind of do everything rod it's one of those rods that kind of can do everything and by the way if you're talking through this don't feel like you have to have a rod for you know this weight bait you know I, I need a rod for one to three gram I need a rod for you know three to seven gram I need a rod for soft plastics I need a rod for jigs you can certainly do that mm -hmm. and that's kind of what we're talking about now but sometimes you just have to decide on something okay so as I talk through this Start thinking, if this is your first rod, what are you gonna do mostly? Are you mostly gonna throw hard baits? If so, then go with more of a hard bait rod that could also do some soft baits if you wanna throw it. Are you mostly gonna throw soft baits? If so, go with that style rod, so on and so forth, right? Okay, so what do we want a bait finesse rod to accomplish? Well, the biggest thing we need a bait finesse rod to do is cast the damn bait. Right, so a lot of these baits, and we'll talk through some baits as we go through, but a lot of these baits will be, you know, two grams, three grams, you know, up to maybe seven grams. Okay, so these are all baits that are on the lighter side that you would never be able to throw on a traditional casting rod that you would have to put on a spinning rod to be able to cast just because they don't weigh anything. Okay, now, just like a treble hooked rod for a square bill or a deep diving crankbait or a jerk bait, you want your rod to have some give through the middle of the rod. So when you look at a bait finesse rod that's built for treble hook baits, the rod is going to have a similar bend, right? So you can see this yellow bends at the tip. It's a really light tip, but as you continue to bend it, it bends all the way through the middle so that when you're casting, there's load. And when you're hooked on a fish, it's bending and giving, right? Another example of that would be like a great hunting rod. 
Okay, so this is a short little, you know, four and a half foot rod, but you can see the whole rod kind of just bends all the way through the middle. So it's a shorter rod designed for close quarters, you know, accurate cast, but again, treble hook style baits. So if I was to throw a soft bait on this rod, it's not that I couldn't do it, it could cast it, no problem. But because the rod bends so much, there's not gonna really be any sensitivity. So if I throw like a little Neko rig or a little wacky rig or something, right? And I pitch it up underneath a bush, I'm gonna have to visually watch my line to know if I get bit because I throw it up underneath a bush, I'm never gonna feel that thunk. It's never gonna happen, right? Because the rod just bends too much. So, you know, it's thunk, but then it gets all absorbed. So by the time it gets to me, there's nothing left there, right? On the flip side, you could do a rod like the cliffhanger, right? It's a fast rod. Okay, so this rod, you'll notice as I bend it, all the bend is pretty much just at the tip. Okay, so it's still gonna have a light enough tip to be able to cast your plastics, but you see how fast it recovers. So this is a more suitable rod for a soft plastic versus a hard bait. Okay, so it's gonna give you the sensitivity you need on a soft plastic, but it's not gonna necessarily load up as much on the hard bait stuff, okay? Continuing on. There's a lot of brands that are just now starting to market things towards quote unquote bait finesse, okay? So I have in my hand a Corrado bait finesse rod, okay? I'm just gonna pick on Shimano here and this isn't necessarily bad, okay? So this isn't, I'm not trying to say, hey, Shimano sucks at bait finesse because they certainly don't, right? I mean, they've got some amazing rods in the X-Pride line, their reels are unbelievable. Shimano knows bait finesse, but a lot of guys consider bait finesse smaller baits for like true lake fishing, right? So what that means is typically when I think of bait finesse, I'm thinking of, you know, something like this, a small little bait that weighs like two grams, right? Or four grams, right? Maybe a little, little crankbait, right? That might weigh, you know, five grams, okay? But a lot of guys are looking at throwing something like this, right? which would be like a tiny blitz. So this is a true quarter ounce, like a seven gram or a Super Z3 from Megabass that might be hard to throw on their traditional crankbait rods. It's just too light. So they need that kind of next step down, right? And a lot of brands are labeling that as bait finesse. So in this instance, this is a Corrado, you know, seven two bait finesse rod. The lure rating is 3 16 to half ounce. All right, which is telling you that it's really designed for throwing a quarter to three eighths. Here, bend that in the ground. Does that feel like a bait finesse rod to you? No. Right. Absolutely It's not. not. not even close. Right? But if this is what you're looking for, then that's what I'm saying. Choosing the right rod can be critically, critically important to this because bait finesse might mean something different to Jeff than it means to you, than it means to the next guy, than it means to me, right? So you've got to make sure you identify what you're actually trying to do. The weight range is probably the most important thing when selecting a rod, okay? So understanding like, hey, I'm looking for a trout stream rod. Okay, well, I'm gonna fish streams. I'm probably gonna use, you know, baits like this or the great hunting, probably like two to five gram. Okay, perfect. You can find a rod that fits in that lane. Or maybe you're somebody that says, hey, I'm gonna be all in big lakes and all I'm gonna be throwing is like quarter ounce into three eighth ounce stuff. I just want need something, you know, bait finesse to be able to cast the lighter stuff. Great. Then there's rods, whether it's in the X-Pride or, you know, Mega Bass or whatever that are designed for that. So just because it says bait finesse on it doesn't mean it's going to be the right rod for all of these techniques the same way that if it says swim bait on it, it's not going to be the right rod for every swim bait. Okay. So choosing the right rod, Critically, critically important. We've talked about some of my favorites and we'll put some links to our favorite rods that we recommend for different styles to give you guys a starting point if you wanna do it. So there you go. Making sure you pick the right rod. That is the first thing you can do to make sure you don't make a mistake. All right, second mistake we see a lot of guys making is not adjusting their casting style to the new system, okay? so. Let's analyze this a little bit. Now, if you're going to really get into bait finesse fishing, you're gonna need the proper rod, but you're also gonna need the proper reel. Okay, now a bait finesse reel traditionally is a little bit smaller, 
in profile because it needs to fit traditionally a smaller style reel. And there's different styles. You could be a low pro like this Alderbaran BFS. It could be a round reel like a Calcutta BFS. Daiwa makes a great, oh, I mean a whole series from, you know, the creek rods to the steez airs. You know, everybody's got some form of bait finesse reel out there. Traditionally, these are tuned with a much shallower spool and they're tuned in a way to handle lighter line and more accurate, shorter distance casts, okay? So, if you're coming from a traditional casting where you're used to throwing normal bait casting gear, you know, traditional like spinner baits, worms, that kind of stuff, you're probably used to throwing, you know, big overhand casts like this, right? You're out on a big body of water or, you know, a bigger pond or whatever, you know, you're throwing overhand, you know, you're, you know, bunch of sidearm stuff. You can, you're doing a lot of more powerful style casts. Bait finesse reels out of the box are going to want to be thrown cross. Okay, so cross body cast is going to be where I would recommend you all start. So one of the biggest complaints is, man, I just can't adjust it. I'm just backlashing all the time. Well, if you spool up your reel and you just go out there and try to throw overhand all day, you're just going to bird nest the shit out of it. Okay, now I'm not saying you can't do this, but that's something that you're going to have to work on. That's something you're going to have to teach yourself how to do. Out of the box to get going, they want to be thrown cross body. Okay, so what I mean by crossbody is if I'm here, instead of throwing this way, right, I want to throw like this, little wrist flick. So if I'm casting on my left hand, it's going to be something like this. With my right hand, it's going to look like this. And I'm going to let that rod, use the whippiness of the rod to load the bait and just kind of pendulum it out, shoot it out. A lot like kind of a bow and arrow, just kind of and out it goes. You'll be amazed how far you can throw a little three or four or five gram bait just with a little wrist flick, okay? So a good bait finesse reel is going to be designed and tuned to help you, okay? So this is one of those places where if you're going to, if you're trying to figure out where to spend your money, <clears throat> I would start with the reel first. I think the reel is the most important than the rod. Okay, you, you have to have both. You can't have the perfect reel on too fast of a rod because then the rod's never gonna load the bait, right? And vice versa, you can't have a perfect bait finesse rod with a normal casting reel because it's not gonna really do it. So you, you need both, but the reel is super important. There's a huge difference between a high-end bait finesse reel and like a real inexpensive bait finesse reel as far as what they'll do to help you. So really, if you get out of the way of the reel and you just, start casting around, dude, you're gonna be amazed how far you can throw and how accurately you can throw. So if you guys are fishing small bodies of water, streams, creeks, ponds, uh, or even lakes where you're making shorter accurate casts, maybe you're running bank and you're just kind of making more accurate casts to the, to the bank, the cross body cast should make up, I would say 90% of your casts. Okay, almost all of them. Of course, you're gonna be in some positions where you're gonna have to kind of shoot it sidearm or you know potentially overhand, but you're gonna have to adjust your casting stroke to each of those, okay? And you're gonna have to reset your reel to each of those. So no going in, if you're trying to throw overhand, you're gonna really wanna tighten your reel down and really get used to when it lets go and how it lets go, and you're gonna really have to dial your stuff in. And what I will tell you on the overhand cast is it makes a huge difference when you change from like a seven gram to a five gram. It's a huge difference. You almost have to start over and reset everything. Okay, so if you're fishing a big body of water and you're looking for like a crankbait rod to throw something like this or a little spy bait or something like that that might be in that seven gram range, you should probably use that rod as like a dedicated seven gram rod and not use that rod to throw seven, to throw five, to throw three, to go back to seven, because you're gonna be adjusting it all the time, right? Whereas when you do the crossbody, when you fish this way, it's much quicker to adjust. You can almost leave the settings the same and then just go because it's just so much more control and the reel's doing all the work, okay? So, even when I was fishing with Toshi, and we were fishing Tennessee and we were running bank with you know tiny blitzes and little crankbaits and stuff, all his casting was crossbody. Yeah. Right, so even on a big body of water, steez air, normal size rod, just 
all cross body. It's just gonna really, really help in the accuracy. And especially if you guys are like wading and fishing rivers and creeks and streams, this is where you can have a huge advantage over spinning rod guys because you can just fish so much faster and more efficiently. You get the bait back in, throw it back out, you're on and your hands never come off your gear. Your accuracy is improved. You can just fish so much quicker and cover more ground, okay? So try that. Try the cross body cast. Don't force that overhand cast and then virtually work your way into other casts. Yeah, I, I think it's worth discussing. So what Jeff just asked is, you know, is it worth talking about what hand retrieve to you? So if you guys are fishing big bodies of water where you're, you know, you're, you're making the cast and you're letting your bait sink or do whatever, then it really doesn't matter what retrieve you use. Like, so traditionally for me, when I'm fishing, I cast with my right hand and I wind with my right hand, mm -hmm. okay? And that's fine in a lake setting if I'm throwing a, a small top water, small jerk bait, something like that. But if you're in a creek situation or a stream situation or a situation where you're being super accurate in real tight quarters in skinny water, you're gonna wanna make sure that you're using a retrieve that's opposite of the, of the hand that you're casting from, okay? So for bait finesse, almost always for me, it's left hand retrieve, okay? So that way my right hand is way more accurate on the cast, but that way I can maintain contact at all times. It's, it's super important because a lot of this water we're throwing into is inches deep, not feet deep. So things happen really, really fast and just that little bit of time to change hands can be the difference maker between the bait snagging, between the bait actually responding right away when it lands or drifting two or three feet away before it actually gets to be moving, okay? So this might be hard for some of you to learn, but much easier to learn the opposite hand in close distance, I would say, than it is far away distance, okay? So give that a try, especially for you waders, stream fishermen, creek guys, uh, it'll make a huge difference. So if you cast with your right, get a left hand retrieve. If you cast with your left, get a right hand retrieve. All right, let's kind of stay on rod and reel topics here for a minute. Let's talk about fighting fish. Okay, now, Jeff, this was your number one yeah. thing that you mm -hmm. thought we should discuss today. Yeah. Why did you feel this was such an important topic? Because it's completely different than how I think m most people will fish. So, like, obviously coming from me, it was the complete opposite. Hmm. Right? When you got a big swim bait rod, heavy line, big baits, you just kind of crank the fish in and then you get it in the net and the fight lasts for 10 seconds. You're like, whoop, double digit in the boat. Right. <laughs> With that. <laughs> Good luck if I you remember, tried to do I that. I like right. a two pounder and I'm like, why am I fighting this fish still after like two minutes? And then I remember, I think I lost maybe the first couple ones because I was just like, just whining as fast as I can to bring yep. it in. And then it would just shake the hook or jump or break me off. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And then you're like, dude, you actually have to fight the fish. And there's almost a technique to it because there is like push and pull, push and pull of, yep. of fighting the fish, letting the rod do the work, the reel, the drag, all that stuff has to come together as one so you can land fish. Yes. So I think the easiest way <clears throat> to think of this as a starting point is you can set up your drag system the same way you would set up your drag system on a spinning rod if you get a good reel okay so a good bait finesse reel uh, casting reel is going to have a very similar drag performance to that of a good spinning reel mm -hmm. okay so you'll hear a lot of times you know and you guys know if you fish a lot and you use spinning gear when your drag is set up correctly you know you set the hook and there's always a little bit of drag kind of going out. So even as you're fighting, as you're pulling the fish in, you know, you may be gaining on them, but at the same time, there's a little bit of drag kind of clicking out too. You kind of hear it like click, 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 mm -hmm. click, click. You wind in, click, 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 zzz, you know, click, click, click. So there's always a little bit of give while you're fighting. That's kind of where I try to put my drag setting on my casting gear also for bait finesse, which is different than how we would do it with like a traditional spinning rod or swim bait combo you basically just winch that bitch down and 
<laughs> get him in the boat, yeah. right? So, you know, this is definitely a technique that requires a little bit more finesse on the fighting side for multiple reasons, okay? A, your line might be much lighter. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, throwing 20 pound like you would on a, on a big swim bait, you might be in two pound or four pound yeah. or, or much lighter line, mm -hmm. okay? So you need to fight the fish. Your combo, your rod, your reel are much lighter. Right. So, you know, you don't have this giant, you know, yeah. winch that you can just <laughs> haul them in. Yeah. But the other factor is when you're using these small little baits, you know, like, here, let me just take one out. <clears throat> these baits are tiny, but the hooks are tinier. Yeah. So you're talking about little itty bitty hooks. And a lot of these baits are built to have hooks for trout, right? Because a lot of bait finesse baits is, is, are really designed for trout more than bass a lot of times. So the hooks will be even ultra mm -hmm. light wire or maybe even single hook or, you know, they just, they have a tendency to not be real stout. Yep. So if you put too much pressure, especially if you're fighting a hard mouthed fish like a bass, yep. you're just gonna be breaking off breaking hooks. hooks. Yep. And then gone. And you're like, oh, what oh, happened? Wow. And you wind in, and three of your six treble hooks are gone, <laughs> bent right? Bent out or Bent broken, out, broken, gone, gnarly. right? Yep. So there's a lot of reasons why you need to be a little bit more forgiving. Here's a couple of tips, okay? So we talked about how to set the drag. So I would set the drag similar to that of a spinning, right? To where it's still a winch. You still wanna be able to pull you know, the fish in, but it still needs to have a little bit of give. So if fish surprises you, it, it has a chance to pull, okay? You wanna make sure that you're fighting with the rod at an angle to where it's going to forgive. Okay, and what I find with bait finesse is most of the time that's at the side. Okay, so the same reason that you're, you know, cross body casting, because these rods are built to kind of bend side to side, right? You're gonna fight the fish the same way. So I'm not saying that you can't have the rod straight up like this, but when you put it to the side, it's gonna give those fish a lot more, it's gonna give the rod a lot better ability to absorb some of the head shake and pulls from the fish. The other thing that it's, for me is critically important is your body kinda has to become part of the forgiveness with the combo, okay? So you'll see a lot of times, like if you watch a really good bait finesse fisherman fish. I see this even with you mm. with swim bait stuff. I yeah. know that you, you know, you winch them a lot, yeah. but a good fisherman kind of becomes part of their combo, yeah. right? Don't want to be so yeah. if, if you're fighting the fish here and it's coming in and the fish, you know, pulls back this way, instead of just letting the rod bend and the drag slip, you, know, you might kind of bend towards it a little bit. Mm -hmm. You might give a little bit. You might reach out your rod, your hands a little bit, and you might just extend that bend one way or the other towards the fish and kind of, you know, play it with your knees, play it with your arms, right? You really got to kind of become intuitive with it to make sure that your land ratio goes way up, mm -hmm. okay? So when you're throwing these light baits, once you learn how to cast them, you're going to get bit like crazy <laughs> Yeah. because that's just how it is. I mean, that's part of the fun of this style of fishing is that you're throwing really small mm -hmm. things a lot of times that it, it's hard if you make the right cast, it's hard for a fish not to eat it. Right. So the, remember, the smaller the bait is, the smaller the lure you throw, it's much harder for a fish to tell that that's fake versus, you know, I don't know, something like this. Right. Right? There's a big thing and a fish can look at it and be like, oh, that shit's bullshit. Right? That's fake. Yep. Right? You throw something that's, you know, an inch and a half big yep. and it's moving real quick, they don't really, they don't have time to really find out it's fake, so they eat it. Yep. much better than a larger bait, okay? So, learning how to fight fish, critically, critically important, okay? So, <clears throat> what I would recommend, if you guys have a big trip planned or you're going somewhere where there potentially could be like trophy fish, dude, you gotta practice. You really gotta <laughs> learn this gear because it is not going to perform the same way that your tr traditional casting gear is going to perform. So go to a pond, go to, you know, 
a hatchery. Go fish for carp. Yeah, fish for something. something that can that can pull, mm -hmm. right? So that you can learn how to fight fish because fighting the fish once they're hooked, so critically important. Mm -hmm. I mean, dude, when we were in Japan, I'm not gonna say any names. Right. Don't say any names. But, but the certain, same guy got somebody. A certain somebody got every big bite, <laughs> and a certain somebody lost every big bite, right? So, you know. <laughs> The experience that you get while you're fighting fish is so critically uh, important to bait finesse fishing. So, you know, please learn how to learn how to fight them on the gear. That's number three. All right, number four for me, a mistake that I see a lot of guys make is I see a lot of guys going too finesse. Mm. Okay, so obviously within the title of bait finesse is finesse. Yeah. Right. A lot of these reels, as you get this gear, a lot of times guys are thinking, man, this would be a really fun way to go to my local pond that just has a bunch of like 10 to 12 inch bass in it, or you know, little eight inch trout, put some two pound on or three pound on and just have a blast with my fish. And th this can absolutely be that combo for you. This could be the way to do it. And you will enjoy catching those fish on super ultra finesse stuff. We use these combos most of the time to try to catch the biggest fish in the body of water that we're fishing the same way that we would approach any body of water, okay? So sometimes your rod's light, your reel's small because you gotta throw a small lure, but you're throwing it around a bunch of snags, you're throwing it around a bunch of obstacles, or the chance of actually catching a big one exists, don't be afraid to throw full-size line at them, okay? It doesn't have to always be micro, ultra finesse stuff. And I'll, I'll talk through what I'm talking about. You're gonna have a couple options when it comes to spooling your reels, okay? Remember, most of these bait finesse spools are small. Uh, they're shallow. So they're not going to have a lot of line capacity to them. So this isn't something that you could just spool up with some 12 pound fluoro, right? And go, you'll probably get about 25 yards of 12 pound fluoro on there, right? So if you wanted to go say straight fluoro, you're probably not going to be able to go much bigger than like four or five pound and give yourself enough line to where you can still fish through the course of a day, backlash, break off a couple times, retie a few times, like four or five pounds probably gonna be about it. All right, six pound might be pushing it. I mean, it's gonna depend on the reel, of course, right? So what a lot of guys will opt to do is they'll opt to go to braid, mm. okay? And do a braid to leader. Now, one thing I will, just a little asterisk to this, okay? If you're gonna go straight fluoro, straight mono, dude, I've played with almost all the fluoros, I go back to this one. Mm. So whatever fluoro you like is fine. I find that the Sunline Sniper is the limpest. Mm. So it handles these real small, real tight spools really well. I've caught my biggest fish on different cigars, mm. but it tends to be a little stiffer. So my casting isn't quite as good, I would say, okay? And that could also just be lack of experience. I doubt it. But yeah, probably not. <laughs> But, you know, so play with what you're used to, but I find that this is a really good line going straight. But if I'm going straight fluoro, it's almost always three or four pound. I live on three pound, four pound, something like that. But 95% of the time, I'm throwing braid to leader mm -hmm. on this. Now, what I was gonna preface, most of these small, lighter spools are so light and so thin to be able to cast these light baits that you have to think about them differently when you use braid, okay? So if you're used to putting like, you know, 65 pound braid on your frog reel and you get it snagged in the toolies and you just pull pull it out of the toolies, right? If you do that with a, with a bait finesse combo, you're gonna break your spool. You're gonna bend it, break it, snap it, and you're gonna be screwed, okay? So if you go braid and you snag, do not use your spool to pull your snag out. You're gonna have to use your hand which yeah, you might cut yourself, but you have to use your body to pull it out. Otherwise you're gonna bend this pull, okay? All right, I pretty much live on, on the braid to leader idea. And this allows me a super thin main line 
but allows me to put whatever pound test leader I need to put for the conditions that I'm using. Okay, so traditionally when we're talking about true bait finesse, we want to be using a line that's somewhere like a 0.5 to a 1 go. Okay, which it would be a, a Japanese rating of line. Now, Verivis has kind of owned this category for many years just because they focused on it. Nowadays, everybody's starting to get into this lighter braid game. I pretty much live on uh, the Sunline, but YGK makes an amazing one also that works really, really well. Uh, I've had great luck with the Siglon and with the Defire D braid. Basically, you're gonna be looking, you're looking for this number right here. Okay, so you see how it says 0 0.8, or it might say, this one says 0 0.6, or it might say 1.0. That's the go rating, okay? If your lines don't say that, say you're in like a Power Pro or a, I don't know, a J braid or something that might not have a go rating, you wanna try to live in like an eight pound, 10 pound maybe at the heaviest, eight pounds, six pounds, something like that. Uh, is what you're going to be looking for. Okay, so I will use this as my main line. I much prefer bright colors here. I know that might seem counterproductive since we're going really small in our techniques, but this line is so thin, it's like hair, right? That it's really important for me to be able to see my line. If you guys are, well, I mean, Jeff, you're a young guy, and when we were walking around streams and creeks in Japan, you were throwing the pink line. Mm -hmm. Do you, did you utilize the visibility of that line to be able to tell where you yeah. were? Huge. Yeah, Massive, you right? you track to see because when it, you're fishing that strong current, it's just whitewash. You don't know where your bait is or if you're going to be close to the rock or not. So when you watch your line, you can see where your bait's running to and, and it, it helps a lot. Yeah, so uh, I, I highly recommend the high vis, but of course do whatever you guys have confidence in. And then from there, I can use whatever leader I want. Now, I would say probably 95% of the time, I'm using one of these, eight or 10 pound floral as my leader, okay? Even trout fishing. Now, I gear my pound test to the largest possible fish I could be potentially facing that day. Okay, so if I'm fishing a small little spring creek that has nothing but six inch cutties in it, then I'm probably just gonna use like two pound or three <laughs> pound and just have some fun, yeah. right? But, you know, even in Japan, you're mostly catching, you know, I'd say three to 10 inch, yep. you know, Amagos and, Yamame. you know, Yamames and, you know, small Iwanas. Yep. But on any given cast, it could be a 24 or 30 inch Iwana or, yep. you know, or Sakuramasu Yamame. or yeah. Yeah, Super Yamame, right? So if I come across that one big bite in a day, mm -hmm. I don't want four pounds, right? Yeah. Some it's, certain person had four pound and yeah. we won't mention any names. Broke off two right. giants. But the thing to remember too is that, you know, if you're casting around trees and limbs and your bait's going to wrap and you have to pull it over, that's nicking your line. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're fishing real shallow water and the bait's running on the bottom, your line's dragging on the bottom, that's nicking your line. So you start with four pound, you nick it enough times, you're down to two pound, one pound, half pound. Yeah. There's just not a lot there, okay? So don't be afraid to go up in size. Don't worry that this has to be super ultra finesse, okay? You're gonna learn how to fight the fish. This will give you enough power, you know, even trout fishing, all the small stream stuff we do, I pretty much throw eight pounding 99% of the time, okay? It's strong enough to where if I hook a big brown, I actually have something there. But most of the time in a small stream, stuff's happening real fast. Mm -hmm. Your bait's moving really quick, so the line's not really affecting much with the bait, okay? So, there you go. Number four for me is don't be afraid to mix up line and go heavier if needed. All right, fifth and foremost, a mistake that we see so many guys make don't get too stuck to using the same bait, okay? Now, I'm going to speak about this in terms of hard baits. We could certainly have this same conversation in soft baits, and we'll do more bait finesse videos through the course of the next season and really kind of dissect a lot of different rabbit holes. But I feel like hard baits tend to be the most confusing and generally is where people try to start, I would say, in bait finesse, because the idea 
of being able to throw a tiny little bait like this mm -hmm. can be pretty exciting, yeah. right? So here's what I'm speaking about and not getting too stuck in throwing the same bait. As you start shopping through a lot of this stuff, you're gonna see a lot of baits that are very similar, right? So I have in my hands a Mega Bass Great Hunting Humpback. I have a Mega Bass Great Hunting Flat Side. Almost looks the same, right? I have an Ima Ison. Almost looks the same, right? I have a Duo Spearhead Ryuki. Almost looks the same, right? So there's a lot of baits that have very similar looks, similar to if you were shopping crankbaits or spinner baits, but the same ideas exist in bait finesse. These are smaller, yeah. but all the same little nuances happen in these baits, right? So one bait might have a wider wobble, one bait might be more flashing, one bait might be designed to kind of lift and drop more, one bait might just have you know a deeper dive, a higher float. All these little nuances can be a huge difference in getting bit or not bit, the same as it is in square bills or mid diving crankbaits or any other bait that you guys are used to using, right? So don't just get one style bait and just throw it nonstop until it's proven that, oh, that's the bait, right? So, I mean, if you tie this one on and you go out there and you're jacking them right out of the gate, then sick, just keep after it. But if you start going through a period where you're making great casts and you're bringing it through and, oh man, I'm not getting bit, switch colors, see if that makes a difference. Switch size, maybe a slower sink or a faster sink will trigger a bite. Switch baits completely and go to a different movement and vibration. So maybe if you're throwing one that's vibrating like this, you go to a tighter movement and it's now tighter and all of a sudden, boom, you're, you're getting bit. I've seen all these things make a huge difference but don't just get stuck in one style of bait, okay? So I'm gonna take just a minute, I'm gonna walk through and give you kind of a, where I would start kind of tutorial on, here's some of our favorite baits, okay? So in this realm, okay? So this would be what I would consider to be like a small trout bait finesse bait, okay? I know it probably looks like a jerk bait to a lot of you guys. You can certainly twitch this bait and sometimes you know you'll use it and you'll kind of just hop it and twitch it but it really isn't like a jerk bait where it moves side to side right this is more of a crank bait it's more of something that you would throw out there and just wind in they're going to usually come in a sinking and a floating okay the floating versions are going to be better for like still water type places so ponds lakes places where it's generally calmer water you can let it float you can wind it down real finesse and get it to dive down. If it hits some grass or rocks, you, you can just pause it and it can kind of float back up. But you really kind of need that kind of calmer day to be able to manipulate it in the best way, okay? The sinking versions are gonna be better for current or wavy type conditions, okay? Things where when you throw, if you threw your floating out in some current, it's gonna land and then it's gonna start drifting down and before you ever start winding, it's you know four feet away from where you actually were, know the fish were. With a sinking one, you're gonna throw in, it's gonna immediately start sinking, and you're gonna have a much quicker response in current and waves and that kind of stuff, okay? So, in this style bait, a couple that you wanna pay attention to are from Mega Bass, the great hunting flat side and humpback. Flat side's a little tighter, humpback's a little wider. For me, the two go hand in hand. I use the sinking versions, I'd say probably 95% of the time. Floating versions are more of a very specific use for me, but you guys might be fishing in more ponds or still water or like real calm creeks where the floating could be a really good option. So try both, see what you think. Another option in this category, these are basically the other ones that I would recommend uh, throwing in this category. So uh, Spearhead Ryuki is a great one. I had the Ima out here, Ima Ison and then the pointer uh, 45S, okay? Each one of these does something a little bit different, and what you'll find is you'll find that you'll get confidence in certain ones for certain conditions, right? So light current, oh, I like this humpback. Uh, faster current, deeper water, oh, I always go with the duo, so it gets down there a little bit faster, right? You're gonna find that you get into certain grooves with things 
we were fishing, Jake and I filmed a video in his small little creek behind his house. Mm -hmm. And he was struggling to hook him up on his inline. He put the ice in on and just started whacking him, right? So it's just, a, it's just a confidence thing, right? But those are the ones that I would recommend trying. Now, some other great options. Small jerk baits are amazing in this category, okay? So bait finesse jerk bait fishing is one of my favorite things. So I'm gonna show you some that I recommend getting into. So in the Mega Bass, the X70 or the Great Hunting 70 flat side, these are money, okay? One of my favorite baits is suspending bait. It's 3 16 of an ounce, okay? So it's on the higher side of bait finesse fishing. Uh, so it casts really easy, but you can fish it just like a jerk bait. It has a weight transfer system in it, which makes it nice to be able to cast. Killer, killer bait. One's in the trout line, one's in the bass line, same exact bait, okay? The X80 Junior is also amazing. The Pointer 65 from Lucky Craft is like a staple in bait finesse fishing. Trout fishing in general, I would say in Japan, one of the most popular ones. And then the Durga from OSP is an absolute killer in this category. Okay, a nice suspending, it's a longer bait, so you're at a 73 millimeter, so it's a little bit skinnier, more of a minnow profile. True suspend, super sick bait. Don't be afraid to try top water. Okay, bait finesse top water fishing would be super exciting. Okay, so again, don't be afraid to mix it up. Here's a couple that I really like. I really like the Dog X Junior Koaiu. This is my favorite bait finesse top water bait. Probably the least used because you have to walk it. Okay, so just like a super spook or a kick knocker or you know, gunfish, this is a bait that walks on the surface. But this is also a bait that even on some bigger bodies of water, when those fish start feeding on fry or tiny, tiny little bait, dude, if you can get your casting down with your bait finesse rod, uh, you can absolutely destroy them on this thing on some big bodies of water too. Little poppers, little bug baits, all this kind of stuff work great. Little karashi, kind of a subsurface walking bait too. All that can be good. And then finally, don't be afraid to try some crankbait stuff, okay? So if I'm like urban pond fishing, I've spoken about this you know, multiple times. The LC series of baits, the 0.5 for me and the DD and the regular is my favorite. They also make a 0.3 if you wanna go really small. I like the 0.5, just casts easy, it dives easy. But in this category, if you're gonna go out into a little bit bigger water, the Tiny Blitz kinda of owns this category. Okay, so there's a regular, there's an MR, there's a DR, you're gonna be getting up to around seven grams, you're almost at a quarter of an ounce. But you can get this little guy down in 12 feet of water and still be in bait finesse, so it just works really, really well. Now, something to keep in mind is make sure you're paying attention to the terminal that's showing up on these baits, okay? So a lot of these baits will be built for trout, so they may come with hooks that, like Jeff and I spoke about earlier, just have a tendency to break. Uh, some of them may even come with like single hooks, okay? So if you're fishing for, you know, little seven and eight inch trout, right? Then a real light gauge hook is probably a good idea because their mouths are so kind of weak and, you know, soft, right? So you don't want to rip them apart. But if you wanted to throw this down, you know, a cool little creek or, you know, a rip wrap wall or something by your pond for bass, you're gonna want to swap these hooks out I use owner ST36 almost religiously or uh, Ryugi Pierce. Ryugi Pierce will only go to a certain size. I think it's 10 is the smallest they make. Owner ST36 goes all the way into the 20s. So I pretty much live on a size 12 or 14 for almost all of these, okay? So don't be afraid, swap those out, put a treble hook on there and then you're good. Even my treble hook baits you got to learn which ones come with good hooks and which ones come with cheaper hooks, okay? And the only way to really know what you're getting is, is you've got to use them, right? So a lot of hooks out of the box will be real sharp. Like these hooks right here, this is the Great Hunting Humpback, super sharp out of the box. But I can tell you from experience, once you start grinding this thing into rocks, right, and those hooks are banging around into gravel, they get really dull really fast. And you'll find that your first couple fish that you hook on this are hooked really well. And I have the same issue with these, with the OSP. So the first couple fish I hook are like, oh man, these hooks are fucking dope. And then by my third or fourth fish, 
they're not hooked quite as well and I start losing them and if I feel the hooks they're really dull so that's why you know for me if I'm taking this serious I almost always change the hooks out uh, with good terminal that I know the consistency of that hook and I know it's gonna stay sharp even if I'm banging around okay so so give that a shot make sure you turn your terminal into something good but don't be afraid to experiment with some baits maybe you're running that great hunting it's not working maybe you switch up to a jerk bait try something more twitch maybe you go to the top go back and forth even from pool to pool or area to area think of this the same way you would think of traditional bass fishing you're rarely going to take the same spinner bait and just walk around the whole lake or fish around the whole lake you're going to use a spinner bait then a top water then a worm then a crankbait the same thing applies here in bait finesse. All right guys, so that is gonna be a wrap for us. Those are five mistakes that we see guys make a lot in the bait finesse realm. Now, there are gazillions of others. And trust me when I say this, Jeff has plenty of footage of me making all of these mistakes. This is why we know they're mistakes, right? So a lot of times the only way you learn how to combat and prevent it it's from actually experiencing it and you experience it enough and you go, hey dummy, I don't wanna do this anymore. What do I need to do to fix it? Okay, so hopefully some of this conversation will help you not make as many mistakes so that again, your frustration levels are down, your fun is up and you can really enjoy this style of fishing. So if you guys have any questions on anything that we discussed, drop it down below and I will definitely get answers for you. Maybe you guys have a mistake that you've seen repeated over and over again that we didn't mention that you have a cure for or a solution for. We would love you to drop that down below as well so that collectively we can grow as a community and all be the best bait finesse fishermen that we can be. So on behalf of myself and Jeff and everybody here at the Hookup Tackle Guys, thank you for giving us time to watch. Thank you for your support and we will see you again soon on the next one. Have fun bait finesse fishing. Peace.